So we've talked about the Big Bang, but there's a whole lot of ideas about how the universe works. So we're going to talk about one of the alternatives, one of the most famous ones. What was wrong with Hoyle's steady state theory? Well, to understand Hoyle's steady state, I think we've got to go back a little bit and understand the development of the Big Bang as we as we know it as a modern theory, right? Mm-hmm. So we already mentioned that there's two things that happened around the same time. There was an advance in observations, and of course, the key observations were by Hubble, but other people like uh, Vestal Slipher were involved as well, whereby they measured the, the redshifts of galaxies around us, the, basically the speeds at which they're moving, and they found, of course, that um, other than the very local galaxies, most galaxies are moving away. Mm-hmm. At around the same time, of course, Einstein had developed his uh, general theory of relativity, came up with his cosmological sort of model. He already had a stumbling whereby he thought the universe was static and unchanging. And it was work by people like um, Lemaitre and um, and Friedman, who basically developed the mathematics to show that essentially the, the um, Einstein's idea predicted an expanding universe. So this is where we get this, this notion that Um, We live in a universe that's expanding, and one of the key observational signatures is that we should see galaxies around us being redshifted with respect to us. So there was this overall development through the 30s and into the 40s that we live in an expanding universe. Right, and one of the other things that's happening, especially after these in the 30s and 40s, is that people start to realise, oh, well, if, if matter gets hot enough, it'll start doing nuclear reactions. You've got to make it really hot and dense. But if that's our picture of how the universe started, there should be some time early in the universe where things are hot enough and dense enough that uh, protons and neutrons and such will be smashing together fast enough to actually form nuclear reactions. And so uh, the sort of famous names through through those decades, Gamov and Alpha and Herman, um, start to work out, okay, if that's how the universe started, what would things be like now? What would we expect to see as we look at the universe around us and in particular they're starting to nail down that it, we should expect there to be some helium you you start off in the early universe with hydrogen it's just just a proton but that but it should be you know uh, hot enough and dense enough to actually burn into some helium in the very early universe and where these calculations really get precise is actually one of Hoyle's, Fred Hoyle, who we'll be talking about in a second one of his PhD students actually calculates in 1967 Robert Wagner how much we would expect, and it's about a quarter. Yes, yes. So, so yeah, there was this nice confluence of uh, uh, interest in nuclear physics mm-hmm. through, you know, not the development of nuclear weapons was part of it, of course. Sure. Yeah. So you end up with the equations to describe nuclear matter, apply those to the early universe, bang, you get this prediction that we should have 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. Mm-hmm. That cooking at the start of the universe gets cut off by expansion. The yep. universe cools down too quickly, and we're left with a few trace elements. And of course, it was Hoyle, again, who's one of the superstars of astronomy in the 20th century, yeah, yeah. who showed that you build up heavy elements within stars, right? So you want to go beyond these few light elements. Yeah. Of course, um, Hoyle is also famous for the steady state universe. And there's an interesting story attached to this, okay? Mm. So in... In cosmology, we have this thing, the Copernican principle, that we, we don't sit at any particularly special point in the universe. Mm-hmm. And when we look out into the universe, there are no particular directions. So the universe is is smooth and isotropic. And that's how we build the equations that we base modern cosmology on. Mm-hmm. Fred Hoyle, with his compatriots Thomas Gold and uh, Herman Bondy, had mm-hmm. some other ideas. And the, the story goes is that this idea was kicked off by watching a rather freaky movie from the 1940s called Dead of Night. And I, I saw this movie, I saw this movie as a child, and it terrified me, <laughs> not because of its cosmological implications, but there's a really scary few scenes in there with a the ventriloquist dummy and Michael Redgrave. And I, 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 you should, <laughs> should watch this movie, but not on your own in a dark room. <laughs> See if you get some cosmology ideas yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the key point of this movie, and it, it struck me, I guess, um, you know, only on a, a, watching it, a, when I got it slightly older, was that the closing scenes of the movie are the same as the opening scenes. And the idea is, is that basically you could watch this movie on a loop over and over again, so the, the movie is unchanging. So mm-hmm. apparently after watching this movie in Cambridge, Thomas Gold asked the question, well, what if the universe was like this? What if we extend the Copernican principle? Not that, you know, this idea that we, we don't live in a special place in the universe, mm-hmm. that we don't live at a special time, mm-hmm. and that we have essentially 
homogeneity in terms of time, that the universe doesn't change as, as it gets older, right? It's always kind of the same. So this is this notion that, can we, can we write down a cosmological equation whereby the universe doesn't change with time? So one of the fun bits now is you get to do the theory, right? Yes. So you sit down, you've got some equations, let's, how do we make this work? And they still had an expanding universe in this model because you, I mean, there's, the galaxies are still moving away from us. You've got to deal with that. But if you want to see, keep things on average the same with time, as things move away, more matter must be created at every point in space and time to make up for that. So the average density of the universe stays the same. Mm -hmm. So you've then got to be a bit creative. So what they thought was there's this new field in the universe which adds more matter at a rate that is completely imperceptible. It's, it's like one hydrogen atom in a huge volume in, a, in some amount of time. So you'll never, almost certainly never observe it. But uh, once you've put that into the equations and it just turns up like a, you have an extra source of matter, you just put that in the equations, then you can actually make a universe which uh, instantiates this perfect cosmological principle. This, the universe doesn't change as a function of time. And then you've got some really strong predictions. As you look out in the universe, you're, of course, looking back in time because the speed of light is finite. And so what you should observe is that as you measure a property here and now and then you look out into the universe and measure it back then, it should not change as a function of time. That's right. That's right. And, of course, again, <clears throat> um, time is... Uh, Time in terms of the development of astronomy, this was in the 40s where this was going mm. on and then into the 50s. This was the birth of radio astronomy, mm. uh, which people were looking out into the universe. They were finding these strange radio objects that glowed you know, brightly with radio waves. They didn't know at the time what a lot of these things were, but we now know that they're supermassive black holes and they're eating matter, etc. And um, if Hoyle, Gold and uh, Bondi's ideas were correct, mm. okay, then you should be able to predict how many radio sources we should see uh, out into the universe, right? Because if the universe is unchanging with time, it's expanding, but unchanging, the density of radio objects should be the same at all points, and therefore you should be able to calculate how many you should see on the sky. Mm -hmm. And this is where one of the famous rivalries of, the, of 20th century astronomy began uh, between um, Fred Hoyle, who was an astronomer in Cambridge, and Martin Ryle, who was also an astronomer in Cambridge, but he was a radio astronomer. So if, if you know the geography of Cambridge, there's a road, Maddingley Road. Mm -hmm. On one side was Fred Hoyle and his theoretical uh, cosmology group. On the other side was Martin uh, Ryle and the radio astronomers. And that road may as well be as wide as the Amazon River <laughs> uh, because th this, this rivalry grew up because what... Ryle's observations were showing he was generating these catalogues of radio objects into the universe was is that the density of radio objects can't be the same that there must have been more of these radio objects in the past at larger distances than there are today hmm. um, yeah. and, and th there was a lot of arguments it, it, some of them a bit too technical to go into to do with the sensitivity of the, the telescopes and how you put all the numbers together etc so this is where a lot of the arguments um, uh, sort of took off. But into the 60s and then into the 70s, it was very clear that the earlier universe we see, the more distant universe we see, is not the same as the universe around us today. There were more stars forming back then. Mm -hmm. There were more of these active galaxies, these quasars, these radio objects. And so the universe has evolved over time, which is a bit of a nail in the coffin for this idea of a steady state universe. And one of the real nails in the coffin, I think especially for Bondi as one of the uh, originators of this idea. Small correction. Bondi. 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 Bondi is a beach. Sorry, yeah. That's my Australian <laughs> accent coming in there. Yeah. Um, for Bondi, one of the real problems was this thing called the cosmic microwave background. So if you look out into the universe, you obviously see radiation from all sorts of places. But one of the uh, brightest sort of things at, some, at certain... Um, uh, wavelengths is kind of the entire sky. It glows with this very specific uh, wavelength. And in particular, the, the collection of wavelengths you get, what's called the spectrum, is something that as physicists is very familiar. There's a, there's a very specific way that something glows when matter and radiation are in perfect uh, equilibrium with each other. 
when uh, energy is going from matter to radiation as fast as it's going back the other way, equilibrium. Uh, so this is called a black body spectrum, and it was written down by a Planck in the you know before cosmology started, before modern cosmology started in the nineteen sort of nineteen hundreds, I think. Very very yeah. yeah, no, but very early nineteen hundreds. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a very familiar, and we see that in the night sky. Okay, you can go out and there's a characteristic temperature of about three Kelvin. And the reason why this is so important is we know the conditions where that type of radiation is is emitted, right? You've got a matter and radiation perfectly locked in with each other. And we can look out to the, to the night sky now, the universe we see around us, and that's not the way things are, okay? You have, you have stars, you have intergalactic gas, you have all sorts of things radiating in all sorts of different ways. Not everything is at that perfect same temperature. Which tells you something, and it tells you something important, that in the past there must have been some time in the universe when matter and radiation were locked together. And we're seeing a relic of that time. But if that's true, it, it would have to be a time when things were hotter and denser because that's when you can get things to lock together like that. So there must have been a time in the early universe when things were hot and dense, but that's not the way it is today. And when you present that to the steady state theory, you've got a real problem. And one of the ways you can see a problem with the theory is the way they try and sort of correct it when, when observational evidence like this comes along. So one of the things Hoyle said was, okay, we could make matter and radiation locked together as long as the universe is filled with a form of matter that's hard to see, but that will interact with radi uh, sorry, uh, with this radiation really efficiently. And it, it turns out to have to be like thin iron whiskers. Yeah. Like, yeah. And at that point you think, that's a bit of a kludge, obviously. What on earth would fill the universe with thin iron needles? Yeah, yeah. We can we can bring um, Occam's razor into this, right? Mm. I mean, what what's happening now is that they're multiplying hypotheses to try and explain the data. We already have a much simpler picture of the cosmic microwave background radiation being this leftover radiation from the early part of the universe, mm -hmm. all fits together in this one picture, and we're not having to jerry rig the picture afterwards to try and explain the observations. So. Um, I think the, the real problem, what was wrong with Hoyle's steady state uh, ideas for the universe, is that they don't match observations. And, and for a scientific theory, that's it.